my friends, welcome to episode number 529 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Folks, I have a special medical edition of Fish Fry lined up for you this week. My guest is Walter Charles from IMEC, and we're investigating microsurgery and hyperspectral imaging. Walter and I examine the trends in microsurgery today, the details of IMEC's new hyperspectral camera, the challenges that lie ahead for this kind of technology, and how IMEC is paving the way for even more advancements in this field. Also this week, keeping with our medical theme, a little later on, I check out why new 3D bioengineered skin grafts developed by a team of bioengineers at Columbia University could be a game changer for the treatment of severe burns. But first, let's please welcome Walter to Fish Fry. Hi, Walter. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Great. Okay, so we're talking about microsurgery and hyperspectral imaging today. But Walter, before we get into the details, for my audience who may not know, what exactly is microsurgery and what kind of trends are you seeing in this space? So microsurgery is the kind of surgery where the surgeon is using a microscopy device, so a microscopic optics, to look at the surgical scene. So that, that enables him to see what he's doing in great detail. And then he's looking through an eyepiece basically into the surgical scene to see where he is carrying out a certain surgical procedure. And I think most of, of surgical procedures are in open surgery, allowing to use a microsurgical device like uh, size Pentero, or using an exoscope, which can be mounted on a standard camera. And then we also observe a trend towards minimal invasive surgery and robotic surgery. With minimal invasive surgery, for instance, laparoscopic devices are being used to get an image from the inside of the body, so not requiring to open a surgical scene entirely. And then, of course, with robotic surgery, using a robot to carry out the procedures. Okay, so let's dive into hyperspectral imaging. How is IMEX approach different than conventional methods of building a hyperspectral camera? Basically, looking at spectral imaging devices or spectral systems and spectral cameras over the years, they have always been realized by combining optical components in between the lens of a camera system and the imaging detector, or the film, if you want. And so that makes that a spectral imaging device is typically quite large and complicated to assemble, Because all these components, they take space, they need to be assembled inside of the device, they need to be aligned to form the image and split the light in all its different wavelengths. And so what we have realized at iMac is the implementation of all this light filtering directly on the chip. So a CMOS imaging chip, like the ones in your smartphone or the ones from your webcam or your computer or in your DSLR, they are made on CMOS nowadays. Uh, which means that they are processed on a wafer level. So what we are doing is we are post-processing the wafers with CMOS imagers with these spectral filters. So the effect is that instead of having one bulky device of all system level components being combined, we are transforming a standard CMOS imaging chip into a hyper or multi-spectral imaging chip. The big advantage of that is, of course, it's very miniaturized, it's very integrated, but the camera also just behaves like a standard camera because it's a standard camera chip. And that enables a lot of new applications. That is fantastic, Walter. So can you give me an example of an application using your HSI technology? Yes. So there are many different applications. For one, what's what's possible with this technology because of patterning on the individual pixel is to make some kind of a veer pattern but with narrow band spectral filters. So that means you can have spectral video. And if you have spectral video, you can start thinking about capturing processes that have some inherent dynamic or where you have an uncontrolled environment or uncontrolled motion between the recording device and the scene. So there we're thinking 
uh, about outdoor applications, agriculture applications, robotic applications, autonomous vehicles. For instance, in the field, looking with a camera on a tractor to find the crops that are ready to be harvested, finding diseases on fruit trees, measuring sugar content in crops, in fruits while they are hanging on a tree, these kind of applications. And then, of course, linking back to the surgical field, monitoring dynamic processes in the body of patients during a surgical procedure. And that is where today we have done a lot of work or where our partners have done a lot of work furthering this application space. Fantastic. So let's look at the future, Walter. What kind of challenges are you looking at in the future in terms of this technology? So today we have a demonstration on a standard chip. And what we want to achieve is to have a market adoption of our technology in a way that it can be self-sustained so that the market has a continuous demand for the technology from real world applications. So from that, our challenges are to go from that standard implementation on a machine vision chip to an implementation on a chip with filters for a very specific application so that, for instance, our technology would be the go-to vehicle for any endoscopic hyperspectral imaging solution or that our chip would be the go-to solution for measuring sugar content in fruits in a certain implementation. So today, there's still a gap between our technology offering and the implementation and the application. And bridging that gap is the work of our future. Excellent. I love it. Well, Walter, I think it's time for an off-the-cuff question. So since you haven't been on my show before, you get the standard off-the-cuff. Okay. So, Walter, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, or the restaurant's closed, what would you have? (laughs) Oh, that's a really difficult question. Uh, um, uh, I would go probably to Israel, and I'm in doubt if I'd go for uh, hummus um, or if I would go for all kind of tapas. Um, Definitely, it would be some Mediterranean Mediterranean kitchen. Um, And and maybe let's let's just pick the hummus. Uh, Yeah, a real hummus from Israel. Yes, it's it's unlike any other hummus ever, ever in the world is in Israel. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Walter. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Likewise. Have you ever burned yourself like really bad? I did recently, in fact. PSA to everyone out there, that steam vent on your Instapot is no joke. It will give you a second degree burn through two layers of clothing if you get close enough. So maybe that's why this next story was so intriguing. Get this, a team of researchers at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center have developed a technique to grow engineered skin in three-dimensional shapes. Okay, so why did they do this? Simple. Current artificial engineered skin comes in flat pieces. Think wrapping paper. And then imagine trying to stitch that together to fit around a hand or an elbow in my case. Yeah, as you can probably imagine, it can be time consuming and difficult. So here comes this team from Columbia University. They may have fixed this problem for good because they have found a way to grow engineered skin in complex three-dimensional shapes. They have been able to create a seamless glove of skin cells that can be easily slipped onto a severely burned hand. So now it's time for a term that you may not have heard of until now. Biological clothing. And according to this team from Columbia, this new kind of three-dimensional skin or biological clothing could minimize the need for suturing, reduce the length of surgeries, and improve aesthetic outcome. Okay, let's step back a second. Skin grafts were first introduced way back in the 1980s and only started with two cell types. That's it. If you're wondering, human skin has around 50 different types of cells. 
Well, this particular issue really bothered lead developer on this project, Hassan Erbal Abbasi. He explains it like this. He says, As a bioengineer, it always bothered me that the skin's geometry was overlooked and graphs have been made with open boundaries or edges. We know from bioengineering other organs that geometry is an important factor that affects function. So here's how they did it. The creation of these new skin graphs start with a 3D laser scan of the target structure. Next, they created a hollow permeable model of the structure using computer-aided design and 3D printing. The exterior of the model is then seeded with skin fibroblasts, which are able to generate the skin's collagen and connective tissue. Lastly, the outside of the mold is coated with a mixture of cells that comprise most of the outer layer of our skin, or epidermis. And the inside is permeated with growth media, which nourishes and supports the developing graft. So, is biological clothing going to be found in a hospital or a clinic near you soon? Nope. <laughs> testing on humans is years away. The first initial testing has only been on mice. But these researchers from Columbia University plan to test the graphs on larger animals next with skin biology that more closely matches our human skin. But in the future, this team envisions graphs that could be custom made from a patient's own cells. With only a 4x4 four four millimeter skin sample, enough cells can be cultured and multiplied to create enough skin to cover a human hand. Or an elbow? Just asking for a friend. So, if you want even more information about these new bioengineered skin grafts in 3D forms, I've included a couple links on the landing page for this week's Fish Fry on eejournal.com and in the description for this episode on YouTube as well, including a link to the associated research paper called Engineering Edgeless Human Skin with Enhanced Biomedical Properties. Super cool. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or, heck, you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of April 28th, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried. <laughs>